Hello there, this is Brian Buchanan, and we'll be talking about visual estimation of LV function in the ICU in critically ill patients. I would refer you to these key reference studies that demonstrate visual assessment of LV function is not only quick and relatively simple, but performs well compared to next reference standard of a formal echocardiographic assessment. What it really takes dedicated training and repeated exposure with some tricks here and there. If we look back to this ACC, ACCP document, we can see these are our key areas from echo patterns to global LV size, systolic function, to recognizing contraction patterns. To do this, we will use our five key windows as we've highlighted before. With these key windows, we can begin to have a more mechanistic view of shock and respiratory failure. At the bedside, you can gain new insights into the exact mechanism and more quickly institute therapy or more further consultation and imaging. These key windows can give you a more mechanistic view of shock and respiratory failure. And this can be complementary to your existing examination techniques to help you really further sort out whether or not there's one cause or perhaps even multiple causes of shock. For some overarching principles of assessment LV function, some key things. First of all, recognize it requires multiple views in patients. One view is just a hypothesis, but two views can help you confirm. Visual assessment of LV function demonstrates excellent correlation with more objective measurements, but there are limitations. This is covered more extensively in another tutorial. Ejection fraction of the left ventricle does not equal cardiac output. This is a well-known but really little regarded fact. An individual can have a low EF and a normal cardiac output, as in chronic cardiomyopathy, or an elevated ejection fraction with low cardiac output, as in hemorrhagic shock, with a hyperdynamic function but low blood volume or low end diastolic volume. Look at the ECG. Tachycardia can make it really near impossible to reliably predict function. Myocardial ischemia can lead to wall motion changes in the associated territory. Bundle branch, blocks is can, bundle branch blocks can change the timing of wall contraction. So these are all really essential elements that the ECG can, that may tip your hat as to the presence of specific pathology. Limitations include tachycardia, bradycardia, bundle branch blocks, region motion normalities, dilated LV, anatomy. Again, these limitations will be covered in another tutorial, and we will focus on an approach that is able to categorize over 90 to 95 percent of patients. Ejection fraction is dynamic. It regulates the function on different loading conditions that, at that point in time, and this really needs to be considered in the clinical context. Factors that influence EF or inotrope or vasopressor dose, blood pressure, degree of vasodilation or afterload, such as would be seen in a valve stenosis or regurgitation. Knowing that when any of these changes, the function, most often denoted by ejection fraction, will often change. Changes in contractility can also occur with stressors, such as a myocardial insult during sepsis, ischemia, stress. In this sense, repeatability is a key strength in critical care and even comprehensive echo, obviously. Knowing that the LV in heart itself is dynamic, and if your patient, in fact, is improving, they may, having, they may in fact be having a degree of recovery of their ventricular function. Traditional assessment of LV function makes use of what's called the Simpsons method which makes a measurement of the LV cavity in two separate planes, in the apical four chamber, in a view that's orthogonal or 90 degrees to this, called the apical two chamber. This is a biplane measurement in both planes and assumes a series of discs along the LV cavity, given the LV is conical. With this measurement in systole and diastole, an exact EF can be calculated. All export machines can actually do this, but I'll tell you, it's quite meticulous and difficult to trace the endocardium with your finger. Instead, I recommend a basic visual assessment. The export can do this, but, need, but you need ECG leads, and it is quite time-consuming, and would recommend more gross visual assessment at the bedside. Therefore, I will say visual estimation of VF is a reliable marker. In fact, in most cases of echo reports you've seen from the cardiologist, visual assessment will be the primary method at which LV function is determined. Our goal is to really focus on how the LV function plays into the context of the patient. Are they in respiratory failure? Are they in shock? And really focus on decision making rather than attempting to focus on discrete details such as the exact percentage of ejection fraction. On to gross categorization. We will parcel LV function into the relatively discrete categories such as hyperdynamic, greater than 70%, normal, 50, 50 to 70%, depressed, 30 to 50%, and severely depressed, less than 30%. Here's a sense of the gross categorization between normal, hyperdynamic with very low and systolic cavity volume, depressed with reduced amounts of wall motion, and severely depressed to severely reduced to almost akinetic amounts of wall motion. 
Step one, we'll focus on wall thickness. In most cases, a visual 2D assessment will do. You need to clearly see the inner endocardium at the border of the inner left ventricle. A change of 25 to 40% of wall thickness is considered normal. You have to make sure you're cutting the LV along precise planes, as being off axis can limit your assessment. You want to look at the walls in isolation. Ask yourself, are they really normal? Do they move in the same time and the same amount of thickening? This begins to train your brain and eyes to, to interrogate the left ventricle. I often encourage people to use their hand to cover up half the image at a time. That way their eyes can focus on specific segments of the left ventricle. M mode can be used in the short or long axis to really examine the difference between diastolic and systolic, looking for that change of 25 to 40% wall thickness. However, this is relatively impractical at the bedside and again, would encourage you to build up your repertoire for visual assessment. Step two. In this case, we should also look at how the endocardium moves. The endocardium, the inner lining of the heart here, should move inwards and the LV cavity cross section should be circular in systole and diastole. In some cases, the endocardium may move inwards, but the wall may not thicken, giving the false impression of wall thickening. Step three, one of the worst acronyms of basic critical echo, is the E-point septal separation. This is a fancy term for mitral leaflet excursion. This corresponds to the E-wave in diastole, initial ventricular filling in diastole. Generally, the anterior leaflet will come within one centimeter of the intraventricular septum in a normal functioning heart. This green arrow here points out the exact area we're looking at to evaluate the EPSS. We can see here a major difference in EPSS between a normal heart and a dilated severely depressed. If the EPSS is less than one centimeter, it is a very high sensitivity to rule out abnormal ejection fraction. The EPSS becomes greater than one centimeter because of changes to transvalvular flow and morphological changes to the ventricle. There are caveats a stiff mitral valve and mitral stenosis or calcification, but really these are less common. Multiple views is key. I have fooled myself many times to take multiple views on different axes, record these clips, like the parable of the blind man and the elephant, make sure you describe the ventricle from more than one angle. You must be opportunistic in critically ill patients. A subcostal short axis is a fantastic view and can save you in a pinch. In this case, you can see that image right is really just a 90 degree or orthogonal view of the subcostal forechamber. This view is essentially the same sagittal slash parasagittal plane as the IVC with the probe sweeping towards the patient's left under their costal margin. Remember that EF can change rapidly within minutes to hours and should be reassessed if there's a significant change in the patient's clinical condition. Here are some examples. In this case, we see a hyperdynamic LV where really we have antistolic occlusion of the LV cavity, or kissing papillary muscles. In most cases, a poorly acquired person long axis can easily make you believe this is the case. That's why, again, I would encourage you to obtain multiple views and ensure that you have clear endocardial resolution. And remember that context is critical. On the left, we can see a patient who's 56, who's post-cardiac cath, has reduced preload and low cardiac output. This patient had a retroperitoneal bleed. In fact, requires blood and fluids to regain their and systolic volume. On the right, this is a 52-year-old male with elevated lactate and effectively liver failure. They have a very low stomach vascular resistance and high cardiac output, the so-called high output heart failure. So again, this illustrates why the context is so important to evaluating an ultrasound. Moving on to depressed, again, we can see our multiple views. Really, there's much reduced movement of the, of the LV wall. You can see also reduced excursion and increased EPSS in there as the anterior leaflet barely comes close to the interventricular septum. Discerning between depressed and severely depressed is challenging, but really just requires you to look at multiple different images over time and for your brain to be trained to recognize the subtleties of wall motion. In this case, we can see here profound reduced wall thickening and virtual akinesis of many of the segments of the LV. Akinesis is really a, a complete lack of movement in this case. We can see akinesis highlighted here by the green arrow in the intraventricular septum where there is profoundly reduced wall thickening. Again, we can see the EPSS, which has a very reduced movement and doesn't come anywhere close to the intraventricular septum during diastole. But remember that a low ejection fraction does not make heart failure or cardiogenic shock. There are a variety of reasons someone can have a low ejection fraction that does not result in heart failure or cardiogenic shock, and so it really requires you to clinically examine the patient and put the pieces of the puzzle together. 
In summary, use multiple views, avoid foreshortening, and again, you'll need lots of repetition for your eyes to be trained to readily categorize and discern the differences between these categories. Even if one solid view, try to get two views to convince yourself that you're indeed correct. And remember that context is critical. Cardiac ultrasound is one piece of the puzzle and it cannot be interpreted in isolation. As your skill in multiple domains of critical ultrasound increase, you'll have other tools at your disposal, including lung ultrasound for pulmonary edema and pleural effusions, which may provide added information. I'd like to thank you for listening and see you next time.